Hi, I'm Carly of Gnarly Carly Gaming, and I have officially finished 30 scenarios of the Frost Haven campaign, and today I'm going to be giving all of my thoughts on all things Frosty. So I got Frost Haven in about mid-November, and so if you do some quick math, seeing that it's mid-December now, uh, that's 30 scenarios in one month, so an average of a scenario a day. Needless to say, I've been steamrunning this campaign pretty hard, but joyfully so. I'm a big Gloomhaven, Frosthaven fangirl. I've actually done three separate Gloomhaven campaigns, and so I was incredibly hyped and set aside all the time in the world for Frosthaven. But there's a lot to say about Frosthaven besides the fact that it's just the Gloomhaven sequel, and so I'm really excited now that I've gotten to experience the changes themselves in a big ways to share more about that experience today. How I'm going to do this is I'm going to make it spoiler safe. Uh, I really don't want to ruin the campaign for anyone who decides to play it. So most of my commentary is going to be completely spoiler free and I'll only set aside a small section that will contain any spoilers at all that you could choose to watch or not. Um, but I will completely set aside warnings for that. So don't worry as you watch about ruining anything in Frosthaven. I'm going to talk about it, share my joy in a very spoiler safe way before hopping into some of the nitty gritty of spoilers that I really, really love. And if you're new to the worlds of Gloomhaven and Frosthaven, that probably meant nothing to you, so let me start with you. A quick introduction is that Frosthaven is the sequel to the award-winning game Gloomhaven, which I absolutely adore, which has been called D&D the Board Game. There is no DM in Gloomhaven. Instead, you go on a campaign, a dungeon crawler campaign, fighting monsters and working together as a party to develop your characters, level up, and then ultimately retire, achieving your character's goal. Um, but all of that is facilitated instead by a scenario book that leads you through different little, mostly combat-oriented scenarios. So it's a little less explorative than D&D and it has a concrete path, but it's made uniquely yours based on choices that you make as a party, as well as just how you build up your own individual character. Gloomhaven is incredibly well-regarded and Frosthaven was its highly anticipated sequel that hit Kickstarter. I backed it, it's here, I'm enjoying it immensely. That's a primer for you. Now, Frosthaven is a true sequel. It's a standalone sequel, so you don't need to play Gloomhaven in order to play Frosthaven, though some aspects of Frosthaven are enhanced by understanding of the arc of the campaign of Gloomhaven. You'll know a little bit about the world of Frosthaven already if you've played Gloomhaven. Essentially, Gloomhaven is a city and Frosthaven is an outpost in this frozen landscape north of Gloomhaven. So they're connected to each other and their stories are connected to each other, but you don't need one to play the other at all. And if you do know Gloomhaven, Frosthaven is going to feel relatively the same. The same basic mechanics drive gameplay. You'll have scenarios that have an introduction, you'll be led into the scenario, but really you'll be playing your character cards that you have. You'll have a hand of cards of varying sizes depending on the character you're playing. Some are humans, some are creatures, and you develop them as you go. As you level up, you'll get better cards. But really each turn you'll be picking two cards from your hand to play, and they each have a top action and a bottom action, and when your turn resolves in initiative order, also determined by the cards, you'll play one top action and one bottom action. Usually a smattering of moving and attacking and applying conditions to either yourself or monsters to ultimately try to achieve a scenario objective. A classic scenario objective in these games is kill all monsters, um, but some of them you need to escape or achieve some other objective, but really it's, it's combat oriented to its core. And Frosthaven is mostly the same. You get a whole new campaign to explore as well as a trove of new character classes to play, but the gameplay is exactly the same. You're going to have that same feeling. It's really outside of gameplay that to me makes Frosthaven so much better. So the first thing I want to talk about with Frosthaven is its campaign management. And so in the box, you get all of these different charts that help you track all the scenarios you've unlocked and the path progressions that you can make in the campaign. This was logistically helpful. It didn't exist in Gloomhaven and makes it a lot better to just see what scenarios you have unlocked, but that in and of itself doesn't make the game better. What does make the game better is how much this makes a difference in terms of immersing you in the world and the other things they really do in this game to bring the world outside of the scenario playing alive. Uh, when I played Gloomhaven, 
all of those times. What I really loved about it was the connections that I had with the people in my party. It's a co-op game. So inherently you're working together in a scenario to achieve what you want to do. Um, you got to know everybody else's play style based on the character they had. Some are more support and other people are more tanky. So you got to have this like rapport with each other that was really special. Um, that is exactly the same in Frosthaven, but I do feel that the larger world really brings you in a lot more. And it starts here with these maps because on it, as you unlock things, you'll basically peel these away to unlock the new scenario. You'll see the scenario title, as well as get a sticker to put on your map. Having a sticker and a map board is nothing new from Gloomhaven to Frosthaven, but you use that board way more. And because it's connected in this way, I feel way more attached to the map board than I ever did in Gloomhaven. It was almost an afterthought when you unlocked a scenario, and now it feels deeply entwined in the experience to look at the map, see where we're going, see how it connects to the last thing we did. But also these charts really help you remember the pathways that you're taking in a more meaningful way. They're color coded along different paths. So for Gloomhaven, whenever I was like, okay, we've unlocked 71, what is 71? I don't know what 71 is. And we have to like flip it open again, like kind of skim the intro just to kind of get a sense of the path we're on. These are color coded and I can see the last thing I just did that led me to this scenario. So now instead I'm like, oh yeah, I got to interact with this cool thing and now this one's unlocked and I have like a better sense of what I'm excited to do in a more thematic way and not just a dance of logistics to get to the next scenario, nor all of us like flipping through a book to try to remind us ourselves what happened previously. These charts right here are awesome. They do wonders. I think they add a lot to the campaign. However, they are just the tip of the iceberg in terms of the cool things they do to immerse you in the world of Frosthaven newly. And so what I want to talk about now is the way events and unlock happen in these games and what that has changed in the experience. Uh, in both Gloomhaven and Frosthaven, if you're traveling to a scenario, you'll do a road event of sorts. Something along the way will happen to you and your party and you'll interact with it. In Gloomhaven, you had city events. Frosthaven is an outpost, so you'll have outpost events. All of that is the same but the way they build on each other is new. Um, before in Gloomhaven, sometimes when you retired a character or if you made a certain choice, new events would get added into the deck. That still happens in Frosthaven, but much more often when you finish a scenario and it leads to something else that isn't immediate. So you don't immediately unlock a scenario or you don't immediately have an interaction again. There's supposed to be a time lapse. You don't just put a card in the deck, shuffle it up, and maybe you'll see it in two scenarios, or maybe it'll come up randomly in a year from now if you're playing a campaign that doesn't meet weekly like mine does. And so you feel really detached from a sense of time. Frosthaven inserts a real tangible and logical sense of time into the experience. And I can't explain enough how much that does for world building. So instead at the end of the scenario, and this isn't a spoiler, it might say, add section whatever in a section book to read to the calendar that you have in a couple of weeks or it'll say like three weeks or five weeks or even next summer because there's summer and winter as well and so instead of randomly unlocking the things that you're building upon you actually have logical time when it will tell you something happens so let's say you do something or you order something from someone in two weeks a normal sense of time so two scenarios someone will come back and you'll have an interaction with it after the scenario. Because after a scenario, you'll always do like a time passes step where you'll kind of upkeep that calendar and check to see if there's anything you have to read. And this is really cool. I, I, I've played very few games that really, really capture in me a sense of like time and progression. And in that way, scenarios I'm acutely more aware of uh, what's going on, what our developments are, the works we have in progress. When I do something and it tells me something's going to happen in weeks, I feel like I'm stepping towards something. And it's not always like said and done. So you might say like, hey, I don't want to know what's going to happen in three weeks. But really what happens in three weeks is it's a benchmark check. And depending on other progress you made, it takes you down different pathways. It really allows for a world to unfold and things to stay fresh in your mind. Because I, I don't know, I, I love Gloomhaven, don't get me wrong. But I had an event happen and then I had to put something else in an event deck and I didn't see it for two years. And it's not to say that I didn't fully remember it, but sometimes I, I didn't. I didn't remember that choice that I made and how it led to this. And so it was a little less enchanting. Um, I really think Frosthaven does a really good job of hearkening back on itself, but doing so at an even pace where it feels like a real world and not a random one. 
So the other big thing that Frosthaven adds to the mix that isn't in Gloomhaven that I think really brings this world to life is the town building you get to do. So in Gloomhaven, when you killed a monster, you could loot from it. This was always money that you could then take into town to buy items and become a badass. And that is awesome. However, Frosthaven does it better. Because when you loot, sometimes you do get money and you can take it and use it and make yourself a badass. But there's much more a sense of world building. It's an outpost, it's not a developed city, and we're building it up with a lot of the other resources that we loot. So sometimes you'll get money when you loot, but sometimes you'll get resources like lumber or metal or herbs. And in between scenarios, you'll use all of the things that you loot collectively in order to build up your town, unlocking new buildings that give you new interactions and can really build you up as a party and as an outpost, as well as to do cool things. Like instead of just buying a potion, now I have herbs and I can brew them. And so you have a whole chart that actually lets you peel away and unlock. So I can like try to combine rock root and aerovine and see what I get. And then it'll help you track the things that you know how to make and you can keep crafting and brewing things for your team to use. And so there's so much more of a sense of wonder in the game and exploration that never existed in Gloomhaven. It was money and I bought something and sure we'd unlock items along the way as our town became more prosperous based on choices we'd make, we'd have access to more items. Now there's even new ways that you unlock items which I'm not gonna fully talk about. But again, there's much more of a sense of tangible impact I feel myself doing something that logically unlocks something. I build a certain type of building and so we can grow as a town. And retirement. Uh, in Gloomhaven, you used to retire and just unlock new character classes. Instead, characters are unlocked when you kind of meet them along the way in the campaign, which makes sense logically. Again, this bigger sense of world building and I interacted with this thing and now I can have them as part of our party. As, and instead, when you retire, you get rewards of like new types of buildings. And honestly, some of them have blown me away in how stinking enchanting they are. Like I, one of them has completely changed like the trajectory of my existence within Frosthaven. I am obsessed with it. I do everything related to it all the time, whenever possible, possibly annoying the rest of my party just because of how much I love it. Now, some of you might be as enchanted as I am at all of that in Prospect, but there is a logical question of, how much upkeep does that take? Because that sounds like a lot more crap to do between scenarios. And it both is and it isn't. You are spending a little more time between scenarios doing things, but really not all that much. What they do is all the different buildings you have to interact with each have their own set of cards. If you like level up the building, you get a different card to replace it that has its upgraded abilities on it. But really you have a little deck and you flip through them to do all of the actions. So I can go through and be like, does anyone wanna do that, 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 that? We kind of go through them really quickly. You don't do all of them all at once. You only have so many resources. And then at the end of that outpost phase, you can decide if you want to build anything new. And so you'll use your resources to do so. You'll add those cards to the deck or upgraded cards to the deck. And then you'll put them aside till after the next scenario is done. They really do a great job letting the management be kind of handled for you. It's quite simple, but it's really rewarding in terms of how much I'm invested in the outpost that we're constructing at large and our mutual shared world. Um, I didn't have a feeling like that at all in Gloomhaven. I was attached to my party and I love my party, but I didn't really have a sense of belonging in this world. And right now, like I, I feel connected to the outpost of Frosthaven. I've built it myself. The choices of how it's built and when and the buildings we upgrade and the things we do have been mine and they've shaped the things we've unlocked and acquired along the way because that's what leads to cool new unlocks now. It's it's the choices you make as a campaign. And, and so in so, so many ways, because of this sense of time and world building, uh, Frosthaven to me is just a better standalone game than Gloomhaven by far. But let's say you weren't a fan of Gloomhaven and you played Gloomhaven and you didn't like the style, you didn't like the dungeon crawling battles, this won't solve it for you. This is a really, really cool way that I think the campaign becomes more alive for you. It makes it easier to keep track in your head. You become more invested in this world. It becomes more of a cooperative initiative as you build up a town. But the gameplay in and of itself is the same. And I love the gameplay in and of itself. I find it very satisfying. It's a little puzzle for me to manage my card successfully and not die uh, and work with my team. But if you didn't like that, if you don't like the dungeon crawling, if you don't want to fight monsters and kill things most of the time, then this game isn't for you. I will also say 
and this could be a pro or a con depending on who you are, there are a lot more scenarios that have you have other objectives. Uh, in Gloomhaven, most of them were kill all monsters. In Frosthaven, it, there's still a lot of kill all monsters, but a lot of times there's other objectives at play or survival to a certain number of rounds or escaping. And to me, that's a little bit of a con. I think the cards are designed best for scenarios that are kill all monsters. So then it can be a little frustrating when it's not kill all monsters. Um, but for some people that might be a pro. Um, if you'd like a little more variety in play. And so that's something to be said for Frosthaven is it does shake up a little bit of it, but it also rates scenarios in terms of complexity. So you can kind of get a sense before you walk into a scenario, is this one gonna be a high management one? Are there gonna be a lot of summons that I have to like manage and logistically do? And so depending on your time, you can kind of pick accordingly if that's a concern. I'm on what is most new and exciting in my opinion. But like I said, I am 30 scenarios deep. And so I'm, that's a year and a half in Frosthaven time. There's actually a part of the calendar is summer and then winter and then summer again. So I just finished my second summer. And so on the campaign sheet, that's like halfway through almost exactly. And so here are my thoughts with that in mind. I am absolutely obsessed with Frosthaven. I love it. I'm steam running it, not just to be able to talk about it on here because I genuinely want to do so. Um, I am beyond smitten with this and just as appreciative as it as I was my Gloomhaven campaign. I feel so connected to it and I have so, so, so much joy in playing it almost every day. More importantly, it is not just a more ice-filled Gloomhaven adventure. It does in some way build on Gloomhaven, but you challenge assumptions that you might have made if you've played Gloomhaven and you have completely new mysteries to unravel and paths to explore. It's completely enchanting and just such a wonderful adventure. So now I'm gonna take a minute to talk about my campaign a little bit. I'm gonna start with pretty much completely spoiler safe things. I'm gonna talk about my starting class and kind of my experience with it so far, but then I'm gonna talk about my subsequent classes and some of the not so spoiler safe stuff that we unlocked and that I've been completely and utterly delighted with. This will be more specific things that have been the heart and joy of my own campaign. Um, I will benchmark it along the way. So if you're wary about spoilers, I will tell you when to stop and where you can start again. Um, but I'm about to hop into it. So if you don't want any of it, if you don't wanna hear about my starting class, if you don't wanna hear that, I will put a timestamp that takes you to the rest of the spoiler safe area where I'm just gonna show off my Frosthaven setup before saying goodbye. Um, but if you wanna stick around, stick around, cause I'm excited to tell you more about my campaign specifically. So far, I only have one campaign in Frosthaven, though I'll probably play it again at a bigger player count. And our party name is Bad Kids to the Back. It's the same as our Gloomhaven party name and it's inspired by Snarky Puppy that is one of my favorite bands. All of our characters, both in Gloomhaven and Frosthaven so far, have been Snarky Puppy inspired names. So my first class was Bone Shaper in this campaign, who's a big summon heavy class, very like witch-esque and has like skeleton abominations that are all of her summons. And um, I named her Coven, which is also based on a snarky puppet song, snarky puppet, snarky puppy. Um, and Coven was awesome, but summon classes just aren't my favorite. Um, I always feel a little bit of out of control based on how summon classes play, because they act before you and they have like kind of an AI mechanism to it. Sometimes you can control them, but very rarely. And so I always feel a little helpless because usually when you're a summon class, you're a little weaker and your summons are stronger. And so once you make them, you're like, uh, like I'm gonna try to keep you from dying and hopefully we can manage this okay. But it, it can be like a little less than ideal sometimes. Whereas when I'm like a tanky character, even like a ranging character, I feel much more in control of my own attacks and able to like wield things. Um, Summoner Dance is a cool one and I, I get very attached to my babies, don't get me wrong. Like my summons were my babies, they were my children. They all had names and I was devastated whenever they died and did everything I could to protect them and help kick ass. And I was really proud of them when they did well. Um, I actually got a mastery with Bone Shaper that was having one of my summons. I play the first round, it survives till the last round, which was a very difficult thing to do, and it killed at least six monsters. It was very, very difficult to do, but I managed it. I didn't manage the other mastery that she had, 
Um, but oh my goodness. Yeah, there's little masteries that are like challenges on different character classes. That's not a, a spoiler. That is just uh, to see if you can swing something and you get an extra perk if you do it. And I swung that one. I made that happen and I leveled her up to level six. Uh, but I was ready to say goodbye when it happened. I just wasn't a summon class person. Um, so I'm going to talk about my second person, which I, I think I'm all the more delighted by. Um, but this is a much heavier spoilery thing. And so if you're not interested in hearing about an unlockable class and my experience with it, I'm not going into super big detail. I won't ruin everything about the character or how you acquire them. But if you're not interested in hearing about that class, and a little bit about them, I would suggest, you know, also skip ahead to the spoiler safe section and you can use the timestamp to do so. Now, if you're still with us, along the way throughout our campaign, we unlocked a couple classes. Cause like I said, this is through the story arc and the decisions you make. I'm not gonna tell you how we got them. There's no point to do so. Um, if you have a lot of questions, you can privately DM me if you're really curious. Um, but one of the first classes we unlocked was the fist class, it's called Frozen Fist. And it's basically a giant Algox. Its mini is like double the size of other minis. It's this big hulking Yeti thing. And he's just a gentle giant. And I absolutely love him. Um, he was a big tank. He was a big joy. He was a hard hitter, jumped in, spewed ice. And I loved him. And I loved him from the beginning. When we first got him, you can read like the class description that tells you about him. And it says with his small hand size, and really what they're talking about is how many cards he has to manage, which is a difficult thing to manage. But to me, uh, I just gave him a small hand complex. Like he was this giant Yeti thing with itty bitty hands. And so I loved him, but he was a gentle giant. And I mean that uh, not only based on the description of the class on the whole, because all Gox can be a lovely, lovely beast as well. Um, but also because of his retirement goal, which is his kind of like initiative and drive in the game. And this is an extra spoiler. This is based on an unlocked building. Um, and it's a whole unlocked mechanic that I find this was the one that was like my big enchanting thing that really drove me, um, and still drives me in this campaign. One of my most delightful moments. And if you don't want that spoiled for you, I'd really suggest skipping ahead. Um, but I'm going to talk about it for those who might not play and are interested to hear some of my joy. So skip ahead really, if you want the like the most delightful surprise, um, but otherwise stick with me as I tell you, I'm about to tell you, leave if you need to, this is your last warning. Um, but what it was is basically we unlocked stables and what that lets you do is it also unlocks for you an item that's a net and that lets you capture enemies. So if you get them down to one or two health, you literally can capture them and make them your pet. Not every kind of monster in the game has this ability. And when you have a net, you can only do it once a scenario, but there are certain creatures that I could take and make my own. And my Algox is only, his only joy and what he wanted to do was capture enough people to call them pets. And when you capture them, you actually get pets. And the ones you have in the stables, every scenario, you can pick one to come with you and it'll give the whole party different benefits during the scenario. So even though it was like my pet and I was like mine um, and I had the net and I was like, that's mine. Um, everyone in my party benefited from it. And so it was just super, super cool and super, super charming. And every scenario we played, I was just like, I'm going to capture this one. There's actually a small, net icon on a monster stat card to indicate that it can be captured before you have it. So you don't have to constantly reference like a, an index of the ones that can be captured. And I knew that, but I did not tell my party that. And so I would go into a scenario being like, Ooh, this one has this and I'm going to make it my pet and I'm going to name it Gertrude. We named it Black and Gertrude. I love it. I love Gertie. It was great, so helpful, such a helpful pet. And so that was my whole initiative. So I had this giant tank that just wanted pet friends and that just made me so unbelievably happy. And so I basically stood there and every single time we had the ability to upgrade things, I'd be like, let's upgrade the stables. I wanna be able to have more pets. And part of it was because of my retirement goal, but part of it was just because I still love that. Like I'm playing a new class now and I'm still just going pet crazy. That's what I want. I just want to get every pet that ever existed in the game. But that's, that's kind of part of the cool things about this game in the world building is like, whatever enchants you, whatever you unlock that delights you, or you're like, Hey, like, let's do the practical thing. Some of the buildings just give you necessities. And this isn't a spoiler at all to say there's things like something that can give you extra resources like metal and lumber that you'll need to build the building. So you don't have to rely purely on looting. And so you can build those up, but you can also choose to build kind of those outlandish things or things like we've unlocked a couple of things where I'm like, I'm not sure what this will give us, but I want to find out because it sounds cool. And most of the time it has been 
some of the biggest surprises have been from building buildings because when you build them, it'll also tell you to read something or if you level them up. And some of the surprises that have come out of that have been phenomenal. And so, yeah, oh, it's just so good. But man, the pets have been my favorite bit so far. So needless to say, I got all my pets and I retired and it was really hard for me to let go of my frozen fist. I named him Bet. Um, I don't know, I just big hulking. You can hate my names, I don't care. Um, but I moved on to another class. Actually, my last scenario, scenario 30, was my first scenario I ever played with this class. And it was another one that we unlocked along the story path. And uh, in a really shocking and jarring way, uh, I was a bit emotional about it. Um, but it's been one of the most unique characters I've played, but it's also been one of the hardest by far types of classes. Just, I, I spread out all the cards because you can pick which cards you want to play with. And I genuinely struggled to know which ones to pick. The mechanics of this character are unlike anything else I've ever played. And so I actually could have started them at level two, but I started at level one just so I could get uh, a sense of who and how to play this. It's, it's going to be a challenge, but I'm really, really excited for that challenge. I played every single Gloomhaven class except Spellweaver, and this one I'm just like completely wrecked by. It was just really hard to know, um, but I'm excited for that. And I, I, it's also not something you unlock at the beginning of the scenario or, or the campaign, so you're not going to be like overwhelmed right away. Um, the starting classes all have ratings, so you can kind of get a sense of what kind of difficulty you want to play with. But uh, I'm really excited by this class. It is also a summoning class. I don't really feel the need to say which one. I'll talk about it more. I'll end up doing a video that is uh, my full reflection on Frosthaven, and I'll probably talk about this class more. But I don't really have a sense of it yet, so I don't really feel the need to overly spoil or share. Um, but I named him Empire, and he's a badass. And I will let you guys know more about it in the next Frosthaven video I do. All in all, we've unlocked four classes seven envelopes and we've had four retirements and again the four classes and four retirements are completely disjointed we've been fortunate to have those retirements kind of align with different characters that we could now play as um, but i'm honestly still really excited about the starting classes i've yet to explore and i intend to explore some of the ones we skipped maybe after this class that i play if we unless we unlock something really cool which will probably unlock something really cool and i'll change my mind i might hop back to some of the other starting classes that i think are a little more fun and funky that i haven't gotten a chance to explore yet but anyways uh if you're still with me hello and if you're joining me again hi and welcome back um all i wanted to say is this campaign has been such an immense joy for me and because we are playing it as frequently as we do i actually set up over here next to my gaming table a complete Frosthaven side table, just so half the stuff can live there and we don't have to overly clutter the table while we play, but also just so it's easy to take out and put back on and take out and put back on. You don't have to do that to make the gameplay fine. It can all fit in the box and there's plenty of really cool organizational systems. I have the Laser Ox wooden one, which I love, um, but I just keep it out on a side table to make my life easy and to have kind of a beautiful frosty corner, which I'm gonna show you guys right now. Um, and so stick around. I'm going to show you guys that really quickly just to show a little nerdy piece of my life. Um, but yeah, so here it is. So welcome to our house. Over here we have a crap ton of games, but over here is probably one of the nerdiest things I've ever crafted, which is our full-on Frosthaven corner. We basically were playing the game so much and so frequently we take it out and off every other day and we don't have a designated game table. We only have our dining table that we also use for gaming. And so having a place right offside the dining table that we can put all the Frosthaven stuff means we can get it to the table as frequently as we like, but also have a place to hurl it off when we eat. And so it also is beautiful because like I said, in Frosthaven, you're using the map so much more that we actually have it hanging up. So you can see all the different things we've built as well as the scenarios that we've unlocked and completed. We track them here. It lets us just like feel a little more immersed in all of it. We hung up the Gloomhaven map, though we haven't really used it nearly as much in its own campaign. It's kind of like a nice memento and kind of designates this as the big cephalo affair area. And over here we have everything organized. Um, I have the laser ox like wooden system, but I used to use Plano boxes for Gloomhaven. And so this lets us just get everything up and on really easily. Down below, it's like a little Calyx cube. We actually have all of the game itself, the maps, as well as a lot of our player stuff, which I won't go through right now, just for spoiler sake. Uh, but it's really nice to have everything here because it has all of the between campaign stuff just over here. So we don't even need to put that on the table. And then I have even little things like a notebook that I've been using to solve some of the puzzles in the game. 
um, that you'll be able to tackle as you get there in the campaign. And it's just such a nice little nerdy corner for Frosty. It's my Frost Haven corner. Anyways, that is all from me this week and my little 30 scenario Frost Haven update. I'll be back next week to chat more about my gaming shenanigans. Uh, this weekend is actually going to be the first night of Hanukkah on Sunday, and I'm hosting a bunch of people over for like lockers and drinks and to hang out and celebrate with me, but we're also going to play the new The Thing game, uh, which is not Hanukkah themed in the slightest, but it'll be a real blast to just like celebrate together and also be incredibly suspicious of each other. Um, and so I will probably come back and talk more about that game next week. Um, but until then, I hope you all have a great week. Let me know if you have any questions in the comments below.